Thank you so much. I would like to start by thanking um, uh, Paul, uh, Grigory, uh, Frederic and Arvind for the invitation to give this, this course. I would like to start, would like also to thank the HOS for uh, being so accommodating throughout this academic year, in particular for setting this machinery that allows me to use this old school technology called Blackboard. And I would also like to thank the, the audience here for making the talk a little bit more human. So uh, the course will have will consist on three lectures. Uh, the first lecture will be about some celebrated conjectures um, and um, about their non-commutative. So I will always use this notation NC for non-commutative, non-commutative uh, counterparts of these conjectures. Um, and then in the second lecture, I'll be talking about applications um, um, of this non-commutative viewpoint on these conjectures to non-commutative geometry. And then in the final lecture, so this will be on Wednesday, and then on Thursday, I will talk about applications uh, to classical geometry of this non-commutative viewpoint on this conjecture. So let me start with some notations. So uh, throughout the course, um, uh, little k will be always a perfect field um, of characteristic p, p greater or equal than zero. And in the case where p is positive, um, I will write wk for the, the ring of uh, p typical v vectors. And uh, capital K for its uh, fraction field. So I need to invert p. So for example, if this is fp, then this is just the ring of uh, periodic integers, and this is the ring of um, periodic numbers. And then I will also uh, write by sigma uh, the isomorphism on capital K induced by the Frobenius on little k. So here I raise to the fifth power that gives me rise to an isomorphism, which I will write by sigma. And uh, let's start with the scheme, which I will assume to be smooth and proper uh, K scheme and of dimension D. Okay, so these conjectures are almost all of them about algebraic cycles. So let me say something about algebraic cycles. Um, so we can consider this uh, graded Q vector space um, where it's graded by the, the dimension. So I look at algebraic cycles of two dimension I on X with rational coefficients. Um, and then if we choose to consider one algebraic cycle, we can impose several different equivalence relations in here because this is a huge uh, graded Q vector space. So there are a lot of uh, different equivalence relations. For example, the rational equivalence. Uh, so rational equivalence says that if you have an algebraic cycle, it's rationally equivalent to zero by definition if there exists an algebraic cycle beta uh, in the product of X with the projective line in such a way that your algebraic cycle is the difference from the evaluation of beta on, and on the infinite. So intuitively speaking, it says that two algebraic cycles will be rationally equivalent if you can deform one into the other using the projective line. Then there is another equivalence relation called uh, new potent's equivalence. Um, So here you say that an algebraic cycle is uh, nilpotently trivial by definition if uh, there exists an integer 
uh, in such a way that when you cross your algebraic cycle with itself uh, a certain number of times, so let's say cross it n times, so this is an algebraic cycle in um, uh, n of, uh, in, of co-dimension i on x, but on x cross with itself n times, uh, that this algebraic cycle here, it's actually rationally equivalent to zero. So if there exists a, an integer such that the cycle disappears, you'll say that it's no okay, So Gonzalo, can, can you really write really bigger? Because it seems that uh, bigger. there are okay. several, yeah, yeah, really bigger, two times okay. more maybe, because there are okay. several people complaining. And then there is a homological uh, equivalent. Um, so here you you choose a, um, a veil cohomology theory uh, so there are a lot of veil cohomology theories I'm going to consider for our purposes solely the, the run cohomology theory uh, in characteristic zero and in characteristic P crystalline cohomology theory um, and then, so any veil cohomology theory comes equipped with a, comes equipped with a cycle class map. So we have a cycle class map towards the cohomology to i x uh, twisted by i, and then you say that your algebraic cycle. Uh, so you can say it here. Uh, it is homologically equivalent to zero if it disappears when you after applying the cycle class map. Okay. And then uh, another interesting equivalence relation, it's the numerical equivalence relation. Um, so here you look at uh, algebraic cycles of codimension i with q coefficients and up to rational equivalents and you can pair them with algebraic cycles of complementary codimension um, and uh, from here you can extract a rational number so you if you have two algebraic cycles alpha and beta what you can do is that you can intersect them so this will give you a cycle of uh, degree zero um, and then you can uh, simply take the degree of this and so let's write this pairing by alpha, beta, beta. Okay, and you say that uh, uh, a cycle is numerically equivalent to zero if by definition um, this pairing vanishes for every beta. Okay, so you have these four different equivalence relations on algebraic cycles and the remark is that, uh, well, if you have uh, a cycle which is rationally equivalent to zero, then it is uh, nilpotently equivalent to zero, and then it is uh, homologically equivalent to zero, and it is necessarily numerically equivalent to zero. So that implies that at the level of uh, algebraic cycles, you have all these quotients, uh, you have these quotients on algebraic cycles, when you impose uh, these different these different equivalence relations, um, and uh, the interesting point here is that when you when you impose this this quotient here at the very end, you get something which is finite dimensional, but here uh, not necessarily is something finite dimensional, it can be very big. For example, uh, there is this famous result of Mumford uh, that if the, the field, the base field is large, for example, if you are over C, then if you take a, a surface uh, with a positive genus, uh, then necessarily your algebraic cycles of co-dimension two in your surface the dimension is actually infinite dimension. 
Okay, so this is pretty large depending on the base field and this is always finite dimension. And now uh, there are a lot of conjectures about these different equivalence relations. Uh, so one of them is this uh, famous uh, conjecture of Grothendieck. Um, the Grothendieck standard conjecture um, of type D. So it's a conjecture from the 60s um, that says the following. So if you... So Gonzalo, maybe there, there's a question that we could, you, you could answer. So for, for all, I just read. So, so someone is confused by, uh, because uh, he asked all the relations are with rational coefficients. Yes, I'm working with rational coefficients, yes. It's not mandatory that, but in my particular talk, I'm doing that and it will become clear why in a minute. Okay. By the end of the talk, it will become clear, yes. Um, also, there's so, a question about if the fact that you start in characteristic P, but uh, you, you seem to work over C, but I, I'm just no, reading. I'm, not, I, I'm working in characteristic P, but my P is greater or equal than zero. Okay. It can be zero. Okay. Um, yes. There is an algebraic if you, if you want to There is, there is, but I'm not on the board. I, I ignore it. There is also, and it will be something that will be seated here. Yes. Because algebraic equivalence will imply the numerical equivalence. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, this conjecture simply says that uh, uh, algebraic cycles uh, up to uh, homological equivalence or algebraic cycles up to the numerical equivalence are the same. So it's uh, saying that there is no difference between these two. So that's a conjecture from the 60s is still wide open. Well, there have been a lot of people working on this. Uh, for example, is known when the case where D is dimension less or equal than two and in characteristic zero, even of dimension less or equal than four, and even for abelian varieties in characteristic zero, and these are results of Lieberman, some old results, and there are many other cases. Then uh, a conjecture of Voivodsky, uh, called the voivodsky Newpotence conjecture. Um, so it's a conjecture from the 90s. Uh, it says that, uh, uh, that algebraic cycles uh, up to new potency equivalence relation are the same as algebraic cycles up to the uh, numerical equivalence relation. So you are imposing here an equality between these two. So in particular, these two will become also equal. In other words, uh, a remark is that this conjecture uh, actually implies the Grothendieck's conjecture, and it's interesting in the sense that it does not depend on any veil cohomology theory. And this is still, of course, wide open. It's known in particular cases, for example, when the, when the dimension of X is less or equal than two, this is an independent result of uh, Voivodsky and Clairvozen. Um, then there is also a conjecture of Bailinson uh, from the 80s that says that uh, if I'm um, over a finite field, uh, then in fact, uh, this conjecture says that there is no difference between algebraic cycles up to rational equivalence and algebraic cycles up to numerical equivalence. So in other words, all the different equivalence relations are the same if you are over a finite field. And again, this is wide open, is known in some cases, for example, for curves, that thanks to the work of Soule and uh, Bruno Kahn, etc. And of course, this Bellinson conjecture implies the Voivodsky conjecture. Okay, so these are three conjectures about these different equivalence relations. Then another conjecture I wanted to talk about is this famous Veil conjecture. Uh, this is from the 40s. Um, so it's a search the following. So we are working over a finite field. 
Um, okay. We are working over a finite field and we choose uh, an integer between zero and twice the dimension and can look at, for the crystalline cohomology of your algebraic variety. Okay. <clears throat> and then this comes equipped with an action of the Frobenius. So here I have a finite dimensional capital K vector space equipped uh, with an automorphism. And the conjecture uh, is, uh, says the following, says that uh, if you have lambda is an eigenvalue uh, of this operator of the Frobenius, then uh, this satisfies two conditions. First of all, it's uh, an algebraic number. And secondly, uh, its uh, absolute value, its complex absolute value is equal to Q omega over two, and is for all possible conjugates of lambda. So uh, in fact, this conjecture was of course uh, in, the, in the 40s, there was no crystalline cohomology, so it was not phrased like this, but it turns out to be an equivalent uh, formulation. And it was proven, it's now a theorem, it was proven by the Lean, um, that this conjecture holds. Okay, and let me say uh, again, an interesting fact is that, well, suppose that uh, we still didn't have the Ling's work, but it turns out that if your eigenvalue is an algebraic integer, Uh, if we knew that it would be an algebraic integer, then it turns out that also, so here the absolute, the Eladic absolute value of lambda is equal to one for all conjugates of lambda, and is for every L different from P, the characteristic of our base field. Okay, of course, uh, the Ling's uh, result implies in particular that these numbers are in fact algebraic integers, and so we know this fact here also. Okay, and uh, this motivates the study of the Acevedo zeta functions. Um, so let me recall you. So the Acevedo zeta function is defined as follows. So you take this product over all the uh, closed points of your of your scheme. And you take one over one minus uh, Q degree of X uh, minus S. So it's a um, complex valued uh, uh, function. So this product converges when the real part of S is greater than D, greater than the dimension. Uh, so we have, uh, yes. And now if we use uh, uh, if we combine uh, the result of the link with some work of uh, Bertolo on crystalline cohomology, we can rewrite this function. So let me just mention you that this uh, number that it's here is actually the cardinality of the residue field of the point, which is a finite uh, field. So this is what you are counting, uh, <clears throat> number of points on, on these residue fields for all those points of your scheme. And uh, so, uh, as I was saying, if you combine the Ling's work with uh, the work of uh, Bertolo on crystalline cohomology, you have a cohomological interpretation of this function. You can write it at this, this product between zero and twice the dimension of the determinant of identity minus Q minus S for Benius acting on the crystalline cohomology of X and then minus one power omega plus one. So this in particular tells you that this function that is defined here, so let me, so let's say we are over C. So we have our function. Um, so we know that it's, uh, so we know that it's defined on this half plane. So it's well defined on this half plane. It actually extends to a unique meromorphic uh, continuation to the entire complex plane. This formula tells you that. Um, and moreover, the, the Ling's conjecture is going to tell you where the where the zeros and the, the poles 
of this of this function where they are so you can look you see that uh, in fact on these regions in red uh, this is precisely the places so where you have uh, the poles in these regions in red so you don't know where they are but they will live in these vertical lines and uh, in these regions in blue these are precisely uh, the regions where the zeros will occur so here you have the zeros of this function you don't know where they are and you also observe that since this function is defined using complex conjugation so you know that it will be periodic of period 2 pi i over the log of q so you'll have uh, a periodicity on this function like this okay this is uh, simply due to the fact that you are using uh, you have this uh, short exact sequence where you have 2 pi i log q z so you have this short exact sequence where you use when you use complex exponentiation so you have this periodicity uh, okay. And then finally, I, I would like to mention one final conjecture. Uh, which is also a famous conjecture of Tate. So it's a conjecture from the 60s um, it says the following so here I'm, I will be over a finite field again and uh, the conjecture they are in fact three of them uh, three versions so you have one version for L a prime different from P uh, so here what you say is that you have the cycle class map um, going to uh, um, the etal, the eladic cohomology, um, going to eladic cohomology. And uh, <clears throat> these uh, elements, in fact, they land in those elements that are fixed under the action of the absolute color group. And the conjecture, uh, it says that, well, if you, if you change from Q coefficients to Q L coefficients, then this cycle class map becomes subjective. So any class invariant and then the absolute color group comes from here, it's algebraic. Then there is also a, a P version of this. So you, you do the same, uh, uh, but now you use crystalline cohomology. So you use uh, crystalline cohomology and uh, you look here at the uh, crystalline Frobenius. So these elements will land in those that are stable, that are fixed under the crystalline Frobenius. And when you change from Q to QP, then this becomes subjective. That's the conjecture. And also there is a strong form of the conjecture, which says the following. It says that, well, here, as I was mentioning, we don't know, we know that the, the poles live in these red uh, vertical arrows, but we don't know where they are exactly. And this conjecture tells you that, well, there are poles, um, this function has poles uh, precisely at these points I. So there are poles in here. So here there is a pole, here there is a pole, here there is a pole, etc. And of course, because of the periodicity, then you would have infinite poles living here, etc. Uh, and moreover, it's going to tell you that, well, no long, not only you have poles there, but the order of the pole is given uh, pre by this uh, precise number. So it's equal to the dimension of the algebraic cycles uh, with Q coefficients, but up to numerical equivalence relation. So the dimension of this Q, uh, Q vector space is actually the order of the pole at this precise point. And uh, well, and we impose this for every i between zero and the dimension. 
that this holds for all these eyes. And as you see here, uh, it's called strong Tate because it's actually stronger than the classical Tate conjecture. So it's a theorem of Tate that, uh, in fact, uh, the strong uh, Tate conjecture, well, implies the classical Tate conjecture, actually for every L different from P. And moreover, if you impose uh, the conjecture of D of X, this Grothendieck conjecture, uh, then it turns out that the converse also holds, so it becomes an equivalence. And this is also true uh, if you have for the conjecture in the P version of the conjecture. Okay, so this is, these are the, the conjectures that I would like to establish non-commutative counterparts of. Okay, and well, of course, let me say this conjecture is wide open in general. It's known in very particular cases. They prove it in the case of curves. Nowadays, a lot of people were able to prove it in the case of K3 surfaces, etc. Okay, so now let me, uh, just before finishing this uh, commutative part, let me just mention uh, something uh, really quick. Let me just mention here uh, that this function, this very interesting function also admits uh, this function admits uh, a functional equation. Uh, and this is a, was the theorem of Artin and Grothendieck. So uh, in this function, you have this relation between, you can relate the function at S with the function at uh, S minus or D minus S. And the relation between the two is given by this. So here you have the Euler characteristic of your scheme, S. And here you have a constant, which is minus the other characteristic, the dimension divided by two. Okay, so it's about that function over there. Okay, so this is uh, what I wanted to, to say about the commutative world. Now let's move on. So what do I mean by non-commutative geometry? So there are different people uh, look at non-commutative geometry in a different way. And so for me, uh, non-commutative geometry will be, uh, will be actually non-commutative algebraic geometry. So uh, it is a subject that goes back to the Moscow school, let's say, goes back to Manin and its students, etc. So the idea, let me put this in words. So there is this uh, standard definition of Bondal and Kapranov uh, that uh, what is a differential graded category, so a DG category. So this is simply a category uh, A, which is enriched uh, over complexes uh, of K vector spaces. Okay, so the home spaces are just complexes, not ordinary sets. And you have a lot of examples whenever you have an algebra or a differential graded algebra, then you have one of those, which is just one of those with a simple object, with a single object. And whenever you have a scheme, uh, then you can look at also at this category of perfect complexes on your scheme. So these are complexes of OX modules uh, that locally are quite isomorphic to bounded complexes of vector bundles. Uh, and then this carries a canonical DG enhancement. So these are two examples. So algebra and geometry both give rise to DG categories. And this uh, very famous example uh, of Bellinson uh, says the following. So if you look at the projective line and you look at modules over the projective line, that category is very far from modules over an algebra, but if you go towards this uh, drive setting, then this category is actually Morita equivalent, Morita equivalent to an algebra, and you have this algebra of matrices. So in other words, this is telling you that 
the projective space in this drive setting, it's actually affine, is given by an algebra, but, but by a non-commutative algebra. And then in this, uh, in this world, there is this uh, notion of uh, smoothness and properness. So this is due to Maxim. Um, so if you have a DG category, you call it smooth. Uh, so by definition, this is just saying that when you look to it as a bimodule over itself, uh, then that it's uh, compact in the category, in the drive category, of A bimodules, and uh, proper uh, simply means that, well, if you fix two objects, any two objects of your category, that's a complex, you look at the cohomology and you ask this dimension of this cohomology to be finite dimensional, and moreover, that the total cohomology to be finite dimensional, um, and this for any two objects, X and Y. Okay. Say it again. Over the field here. Yeah, I'm, I'm working over a base field, little k. It's always our little k. It can be more general. You can work over a commutative ring or even over a, a different base. Yeah, it can be very general. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the key remark is that if you have a, a scheme which is smooth and proper, uh, then that implies that, well, this category, it's actually smooth and proper in this sense, and also the converse holds. So this uh, perfect complexes on a scheme actually reflects these properties of smoothness and properness. And so the idea here, it's now uh, we would like to do geometry, not with the scheme, but uh, with an arbitrary DG category, a smooth and proper one, which mimics smooth and proper schemes, right? So what can be done in that case? So in particular for this course, I would like to phrase, to formulate the, the non-commutative counterparts of all these conjectures. So if we, I want to do that, in particular, I would like to have some kind of non-commutative veil cohomology theory. So something that works not just for schemes, but in full generality. So and for this, let me talk about uh, topological uh, uh, periodic uh, cyclic homology. Uh, so this, uh, let me put some names on the board. So this to, to Alan Kahn and many others, this to Hesselhold, uh, to Schultz and uh, many others. Um, so uh, let me give you an idea of this. So I suggest to look at the course of Tina last week and also of Kaledin if you want to learn more about these things. So let's suppose to simplify that I just have an algebra an ordinary algebra with A, what can I do? I can do the following. I can do the following construction. I can look at A, A cross with itself over the base field, A cross with itself, cross with itself over the base field. And now I can use the multiplication to define maps. I can multiply these two, that gives me a map, but I can multiply by this order that gives me a different map. So it's not necessarily commutative algebra. And here also I can multiply these two or these two, or even these two. So, and in fact, I get this simplicial gadget and I can totalize it. Uh, and if you totalize it, you get something that is called a Uschild homology of A. And that is something that is k-linear. So for example, the Uschild homology of our base field is actually the base field itself. And now you see that at every level, what you can do, you have an action uh, you can permute the factors in a cyclic order. So if you put that information all together, that gives you an action of the circle. So you have an action of the circle on this object. So you can do a Tate construction. And if you do this Tate construction, what you end up is that with a periodic cyclic homology of A. And this again is something that is linear, 
but uh, it's more than that. It's actually periodic. So, for example, if you compute it over the base field, that's a, a ring of uh, polynomials on one variable, of Lorentz polynomials on one variable, of variable being a minus two, of degree minus two. Okay, so you get something periodic, two periodic. So, Gonzalo, there's a question, maybe I've missed it. Uh, uh, um, is there a way to define smooth and proper relatively? So if I have a map of DG categories, I can define a smooth proper morphism. Yes, uh, there is. Uh, I don't remember from the top of my head, but yeah, there is, and that it's also in the literature. I can dig in and then forward the definition. Yes, there is a relative setting. Yeah. Um, and now what I want to consider is, let's go to, this is an arbitrary characteristic. Let's go uh, to characteristic P, positive characteristic. Okay, now in positive characteristic, I can do this topological version of periodic cyclic homology and uh, roughly speaking, what I do is that I change the base field and now I do tensor products over the sphere spectrum. Okay, so I get the base, which is even more initial than the original one. And I can totalize this construction and get something which is a topological version of this Hochschild homology, which is still something K linear. So if you take the THH, of little k, that's a result of Bockstead. So this is a, a ring of polynomials on one variable of degree two. Okay, but then it turns out that there is a relation between the two. This is actually a, mod a module over this. And so one thing that you can do is that you can uh, take the, uh, the tensor product over k. So in other words, you can think about this as one parameter deformation of Hochschild homology on this parameter here. So when you take the fiber at zero, you get the original Hochschild homology. That's one way to think about it. And then here uh, you can mimic. So again, you have actions of the cyclic groups, these permutations. If you put them all together, that gives you an action of the circle. And you can do a, a Tate construction in this topological sense that's uh, called uh, Greenlee's uh, construction and you get uh, this topological version uh, uh, which now uh, no longer it's k linear so for example when you compute it over uh, the base field uh, what you get it's uh, the ring of weak factors uh, where you have added one variable uh, of degree minus two so uh, you see that uh, from this computation and this, you see that this one is actually a characteristic zero lifting of this one, because if you reduce mod p, the vit vectors, you end up with your base field. And this is true in general. In fact, this is a characteristic zero lifting of the periodic cyclical mode. And now here you can do something that you cannot do in algebra, which is I can invert p. And that will be important for us. Because if I can invert P, then a new feature appears here in the topological world that does not exist in the algebraic world. And this new feature is this uh, cyclotomic Frobenius. Is this, uh, is this cyclotomic Frobenius? So uh, again, I mean a, a positive characteristic. So let me mention uh, what I'm going to say. It's uh, in this topological language, but this is was originally defined by Kaledin. So Kaledin is the, the, the first person that actually make this rigorous. So let me just make a remark. Suppose that you have a commutative uh, algebra. Okay, so if you have a commutative algebra, K algebra N over a field of characteristic zero, then um, what you know is that these two relations hold. So if you do A plus B for any two elements, that's AP plus BP, and the product is also AP times BP. But now if you, if you are no longer working with commutative gadgets, then these things don't hold. So you don't actually have a Frobenius. But the Frobenius will appear not on the algebra itself, but will appear in this realization. In this, so uh, if you have a uh, if you have a, a smooth proper a smooth proper um, DG category, uh, then you can look uh, at its THH of A, 
And this THH of A, it's actually uh, something called the cyclotomic spectrum uh, in the sense that uh, it doesn't, not only it has this circle action that I've used here, not only I have this circle action that you use to define the TP, but moreover, it has this map uh, that goes from THH uh, from A to the THH of A and the take construction with respect to the uh, cyclic group of order P. And we have a question, Gonzalo. So what about the definition of TP of K in characteristic zero? Yeah, how, yes. How we uh, define? I'm, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, we can do that uh, similarly, but I'm just focusing in, in characteristic zero for the, for. Uh, but for are we defining, uh, what about, with the, are we defining zero, zero typical vid vectors just to be K itself or? No, no, I'm just, I just want to work here. In the case when I'm working with uh, topological. Uh, okay. I'm just working in characteristic zero, okay? And in deposit in characteristic. Yeah, well, that's it. And so here I want, I have this map, uh, which is S1 equivariant. So here you have an action of S1 and here you have a residual action of S1 also, or if you want of S1 modulo, the CP, but that identifies with S1. And so it's these two data is called the cyclotomic spectrum. I mean, it's more general, but I'm over P. And then out of this data, what you can do is you look at THH of A, uh, and then you look at THH of A, and then so you have a, uh, what you can do here is that you have a canonical map from the homotopy fixed points of the circle action to the uh, Tate construction. You have a canonical map here, and this Tate construction is what we call the TP of A. And moreover, uh, it turns out that in this setting, so if you are working with the smooth proper DG category, uh, it turns out that this is similar to the THH of A, uh, where you have the take construction of CP, and then you take the uh, homotopy fixed points with respect to S1. So it's a, a technical result, you have this equality, but that implies that you have another map here. So you take this original map and you take the homotopy fixed points with respect to S1. And now you have these two maps and it turns out that the kernel of the canonical map has, uh, is k-linear. So if I invert P, that kernel disappears. In other words, this map here becomes an isomorphism. So if it becomes an isomorphism, then I can define uh, a cyclotomic uh, Frobenius uh, here, uh, which is simply you take this map uh, and you compose with the inverse of the canonical map, and that gives you a Frobenius from TP uh, 1 over P, if you invert P, to TP of A where you inverted P, and moreover, this map is an isomorphism. So the Frobenius exists here after inverting P, but it doesn't exist uh, originally in contrast with the commutative world. It doesn't exist on the algebra itself, only on the invariant. And let me make some remarks about this uh, cyclotomic Frobenius. So first of all, uh, it is not uh, a linear. Um, so it's not a, a, a Z2 graded map. So it's not linear uh, here. So in contrast, you only have this relation when you change from N to N minus two. So these are equal up to this multiplication by one over P. And uh, and uh, moreover, these uh, maps that you have, they are not, uh, uh, as in commutative geometry, they are not uh, uh, capital K linear. They are only, uh, they are only sigma semilinear. Okay, so in particular, if you, if you are working over a finite field, uh, one thing that you can do is to compose and get the actually k-linear maps. So you, you simply compose the phi n uh, r times, that gives you something which is k-linear. And then the relation between these different Frobenius when you change from n to the Frobenius n minus two, it's actually a multiplication by one over q. Gonzalo, so there, there is a question. 
don't we need uh, uh, something like a being perfect for the Frobenius to be an equivalence? So uh, it comes, everything comes from my assumptions on A being smooth and proper. This will imply uh, the equivalence on the Frobenius. Um, okay, so now uh, this suggests that, uh, well, these are, we should think about uh, periodic cyclic homology and topological shield homology as uh, non commutative veil conjectures. So that's what we are going to replace uh, actually the, the RAM cohomology and the crystalline cohomology. But there is uh, something that we can do, something. Uh, uh, we can do the following. We can let me just write on a side. I mean, can, can you leave the blackboard? Oh, yes, uh, of course. Yeah. Sorry. So let me just write uh, an aside here um, about non commutative uh, motivic realizations. So one may wonder well, we can maybe extend all the commutative results to the non-commutative results. Uh, and there is this result saying that, well, you can look at smooth schemes um, and you can go to uh, morel Vyvodsky stable homotopy category, stable A1 homotopy category of schemes. Um, and, and, the, and then on the non-commutative side, you have DG categories and we can construct a non-commutative version of this uh, morel vojvodsky category. With, uh, so I'm not going to define this in this course. It's just an aside. I'm just telling you an aside. And these things are related because if you have a scheme, you can pass to the perfect complexes. And then we would like to relate the two. So here, the relation is as follows. Here, we have a, a motivic spectrum that uh, represents uh, homotopy K theory, so we can look at modules over a KGL with Q coefficients. And then you see here, this is a, a covariant procedure and this is a contravariant procedure. This is contravariant, so we need a duality. So we, we, we can dualize here. And then it turns out that there exists a, a functor here, which has a lot of good properties. It is fully faithful. Uh, it is a tensor functor and it admits even a, a right adjoint. Okay. And then uh, as a consequence of that, as a consequence of this uh, breach between the commutative and the non-commutative world in this setting, we have the following corollary. Uh, so we can do the following. Suppose that you have a, a realization that we'd like to be interested in. So here you have Morel, you have uh, Vyvodsky category of uh, geometric motives and you have a realization. And what you can do, you can pre-compose with duality. So let's say that we are with Q coefficients, we can pre-compose with duality and then go to schemes. So we have this contravariant functor on schemes and then I can modify this realization. So here I have a Tate object which is nothing but uh, this, this one. And then I can somehow trivialize it by considering modules over this sum over all possible powers of RT. So I get a modified realization and it turns out that uh, if I do this modified realization, when you pass from schemes to DG categories in this sense, then all these kind of uh, modified realizations, they can be extended to the non-commutative world. So you get, there exists a non-commutative version of the, the realization. So in particular, you get uh, this result, is, you get, it gives rise to a lot of uh, uh, non-commutative uh, motivic realizations. For example, uh, for example, a neoladic version, an odd, uh, version, a Durham Betty uh, version that, for example, can lead you to define the, what are non commutative periods, etc. And how is this corollary obtained? Well, um, 
this corollary is obtained as follows. Let me just explain this. So you have, uh, you can do exactly the same thing uh, in here, but uh, instead of KGL, you can use the spectrum that represents motivic cohomology. Okay, um, can do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to, sorry, I, I need some space. I'm going to erase the corollary, but uh, so I just want, I have this realization and I want to extend it to the non commutative world. And let me do it here. So you do the, exactly the same. And now uh, the first point is that, well, this is DM, uh, the big DM. This is a result of rondings and pole post uh, And so this composition is your motivic realization, or what, a map of Vygotsky. So here you have your realization going towards your T. And uh, the second observation is that the KGL with Q coefficients, it's actually this trivialization. So you get uh, this by M to N. So you have this, this fact here. And so this is simply telling you that you can base change here from coefficients uh, on the motivic uh, cohomology to KGL. And, it, and then it, you can do the same thing on the target. So if you do the same thing on the target, uh, you can simply comp look at modules on the sum of your realization of your Tate model. And you get this induced map here. And so your non-commutative uh, extension, it's actually you use this functor. And then what you do is that you use the, the joint and then you use this induced map. And that is your way to extend any kind of a realization. Uh, as long as you modify it, then it can be extended to this setting. Of course, this uh, is a bit, is, is cheating, right? Because uh, you are defining this using schemes. You are just using an adjoint. You are just building this functor using schemes. You look at the closest scheme associated to your non-commutative motive and apply the classical invariant. So it has a lot of problems. For example, you do, you, these things are not monoidal. For example, they, you don't have finiteness on this. So it shouldn't actually be called a, a realization. But it's something that it can be done, okay? You can always extend anything in the commutative world to the non-commutative world via this adjoint. Okay, but it's, it's a bit cheating, yeah. Okay, so now we are ready to come back to our original goal. And now we can actually formulate all the, the conjectures. And so, uh, um, yeah. Yes. Non yes. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm getting. Uh, you have you have some kind of. Uh, I'm just saying that. Uh, suppose that you have a, a realization. <laughs> or suppose that you have a realization. So it's is this. Uh, so this map, this realization, uh, and then as soon as you modify it in the sense that you trivialize the Tate motive, then you can extend it to any DG category by, via this procedure. Okay. But of course, this is using an adjoint, so it's not a, a correct way to do it. You, what you want to do is to have an intrinsic definition that is not using actually schemes, right? Gonzalo, what was the, what was the question? We did not have... Uh, it was just uh, to explain a little bit better the board. Okay. Okay, so now uh, what's the replacement of algebraic cycles it's the Grothendieck group. So now uh, I have a, a smooth and proper um, K linear uh, DG category. And uh, we look at the, it's K0. Well, it's K0, it's just a K0 of its drive category, which is a, a triangulated category. Okay, and now we, we fix, uh, we choose uh, an element in here, 
in the K0, and we can phrase all the similar uh, equivalence relations. So we can say, we can talk about nilpotent equivalence. So you say that the cycle uh, is nilpotently trivial if by definition there exists an integer such that when you tensor uh, the cycle with itself uh, n times, uh, then this is something that lives on the k0 of a tensor it with itself n times, that this is actually becomes zero. So you can make this definition. Um, how about homological equivalence? Well, we now have this, uh, our non-commutative veil cohomology theories that I've explained. So you, you define homological equivalence uh, as follows. So you simply say that uh, here you have, so this comes equipped also with charm characters. So this is something that I will explain better on Wednesday. So here you have charm characters defined on the, from the K0 to uh, the positive part of the periodic cyclic homology and the positive part of the topological periodic cyclic homology. And you simply say that, well, it's uh, homologically trivial if the, the charm character of it, is, it becomes zero. And you also have the numerical uh, equivalent. So here, uh, how do you define intersection of cycles? Well, what you can do is you look at uh, K0 and you define a pairing on K0 as follows. So if you have a module and another one and look at the corresponding classes, one thing that you can do is to look the homes on the drive category of your A look at the homes from n to the shifts of n, okay, and look at these dimensions, and then take uh, an alternating sum of these dimensions for n varying on the integers. And so in this way, we extract this number and this pairing, they extract the pairing on the k0, which is neither symmetric, neither is q symmetric, but the, since a is smooth and proper, it turns out that uh, you have a ser functor and using this ser function, you can prove that the left and right kernel, which a priori are different, are in fact the same. So you can actually define uh, something numerically trivial if uh, this pairing, let me call C of alpha beta, it's equal to zero for every beta. Okay, and then we have the similar remarks. So uh, if, you have, if we have a cycle, which is uh, nilpotent, the trivial will be uh, homologically trivial, will be uh, numerically trivial. So that implies that on the K0, you have all these, these quotients, modulo the nilpotent, modulo the homological, modulo the numerical. And again, this is always finite dimension. Does it mean this new potency equals to zero? That means the other characteristic is zero? No, it means that uh, being zero here means that uh, uh, this pairing vanishes for every B. An alpha such that this pairing vanishes for every B. The equivalence, this new potency implies this. Uh, equivalence you mentioned? Yes. So this implies the homological? Yes, implies the homological, yes. It's, a, it's an exercise, yeah. If you have something new potently trivial, it will be homologically trivial. Okay, and now we, using this, we can, uh, we can, as you expect, we can do uh, formulate this, this non-commutative counterparts. So we have this non-commutative Grothendieck standard conjecture. So what you say here, it's uh, here it's a conjecture, let's see, D uh, 
So this is of type D. Um, so D and C of A. So this simply says that the K0, when you mod out by homological or by uh, numerical, they are the same. Uh, also, you can define uh, this non commutative version of the Voivodsky uh, new potent equivalent, uh, new potent conjecture. So uh, let me write conjecture uh, V and of C. So again, it's that the K0 up to new potent equivalence is the same as the K0 up to numerical equivalence. So once again, uh, if these two, if these two are the same, then these two are the same. In other words, this conjecture implies the preceding one. And of course, we can also define the, the non-commutative version of Bailinson uh, conjecture. So over a finite field, um, that uh, in fact, uh, the K0, it's insensitive to all these equivalence relations. Okay, so these are the analogs. And then we can also go further and define the non commutative version of the Veil conjecture. So, what do we do here? So, again, we are over a finite field. Um, and so, if we have a smooth and proper DG algebra, sorry, DG category, you will look at this finite dimensional capital K vector space and it's equipped with this automorphism, the Frobenius zero, so it's just the cyclotomic Frobenius composed R times, and the same thing, the TP1 over P comes with this Frobenius, uh, here composed uh, R times, and then uh, the conjecture is that, uh, the conjecture is that, uh, um, if you take a, an eigenvalue, if this is an eigenvalue of uh, the Frobenius zero respectively of the Frobenius one, then, well, that these numbers are Hausbrack numbers. And secondly, that the complex absolute value is equal to one, respectively equal to square root of Q and this uh, for, uh, for all conjugates of uh, lambda. And also in this non-commutative world, we have this analog of the proposition, which says that, well, if there exists an integer such that, uh, such that uh, uh, when you multiply your lambda by Qn, and if you get uh, uh, an algebraic integer, then it turns out that the Eladic absolute value of lambda is actually equal to one for all conjugates of lambda and is for every prime different from P. Okay, so you also have this result. Of course, it's conditional in this case in contrast with the commutative world. And uh, also we have this... Uh, Gonzalo, how much time do you need still? Uh, I just have uh, one, one and a half. Uh, okay. It's pretty quick. Thank you. So let me just say that uh, in the in the so maybe there's a question: Is this uh, is the, are these conjecture K theory Morita invariant? Yes, of course. Yes, yes, because uh, anything that is Morita equivalent. Uh, will actually have the same motive. Let me give you a very technological answer. Uh, have the same non-commutative motive and all these conjectures descend to non-commutative motives. That's the approach that I will explain on Wednesday. Yes. Um, and also we can talk about the non-commutative Acevedo uh, zeta functions. 
so here, of course, we cannot count points. The only thing that we can do is we need actually an embedding of capital K into C. Uh, and then if we choose this embedding, we can define this. So the only thing that we have is the cohomology. So what we can do is, is consider this function, the determinant 1 minus QS, and then the Frobenius at zero, but we, then we need to use this embedding to go towards C because here we are using complex conjugation in order that to make sense. Then you take the PA here and then you need to, to go to C. And then you can do the same story here. Uh, you can define it uh, in this way. So determinant one minus Q minus S, the Frobenius one uh, going to C. Uh, on the PP1. Okay, so we have these functions, of course, uh, over C, uh, they are uh, meromorphic. And uh, what this is telling you is that, uh, uh, again, by, by own definition, they are, they are periodic uh, with this period. And uh, by, by what the, uh, our non commutative version of the Ville conjecture is telling you is, is that the poles uh, are actually here uh, in this case and are actually at one half in this case. So the, when, we change the, when we change the embedding, these functions change, but the place where the poles are the, actually do not change. And uh, uh, finally, let me just say that we also have the non-commutative version of the Tate conjecture. So I recall you that uh, we are over a finite field. Um, so we are over a finite field. And uh, the conjecture is as follows. Um, so we have this uh, non-commutative version for L different from P. So here what you do is you look at the K theory of A and you base change it to the field extensions. And then you do the Boltz field vocalization with respect to topological K theory. And now you look at the pi minus one of this this abelian group, and then you do the, the TL of this. So you, you do the, the, the Eladic Tate module of this, and you ask it to, to, to be zero for every n greater or equal uh, than one. So it's a, this vanishing conjecture saying that, well, all these uh, Tate modules, Eladic Tate modules of this abelian groups vanish for every possible n, for every possible extension. That's one way to phrase it. Then we have the p version of this. So here it, uh, you have the churn character uh, going towards tp0 of a. So and you, you inverted p and you, it lands on the invariance under the cyclotomic Frobenius. So when you change from q to qp, this is subjective. And you also have a strong form of the Tate conjecture. So you say that the order at a zero of this function, A, S. So you say that, well, there's actually the zeros are here, but there is actually a pole here. Uh, and this pole is the order of this pole is given by the dimension of the K zero of A modulo numerical equivalent. So we should like to emphasize that this thing here actually does not depend, does not depend uh, on the embedding, okay? Because you can rethink about this, if you see the definition, it's just the algebraic multiplicity of one of this operator. It does not depend on the embedding. That's what it's the order of the pole there. Um, and then we also have this result saying that the, this strong form of the Tate conjecture implies the Tate conjecture itself. Uh, and moreover, if you add this non-commutative version of Grotendieck's 
conjecture, this becomes equivalent. So what is the upshot of all this? The upshot of all this is the, the following theorem, which is the very last one, and I'll end there. It's just saying that uh, all these definitions are the correct ones in the following sense. Uh, so it's the, the following. So if you take a skin, a smooth proper skin, okay, skin, let's, okay. And then you can do two things. You can look at the, the conjecture for X, where C is any one of these conjectures. So D, V, so Grotendieck, uh, Wojewodski, Bellingson, Vail, Tate, Tate, uh, the Tate, and many others, in fact. Uh, you can do this. Another thing that you can do is look at the non-commutative version of the conjecture for the associated DG category. And so if this conjecture holds, it turns out that this implies that the non-commutative version also holds. But what's in interesting in the theorem is that this is actually an equivalent. So this is saying that these classical conjectures, all of them, that are formulated in this uh, setting of algebraic geometry, in fact, they make sense in this much larger setting of DG categories, smooth proper DG categories. And if you plug, if you attack this particular kind of DG category, you recover the original conjecture. And this is true for these conjectures that I explained today, but there are many other conjectures for which this holds. I don't have time to explain. And now what is the idea is to explore that here, now I have non-commutative techniques to try to attack the right-hand side and as a consequence, attack the left-hand side. And this is the goal of the, the following lectures. Okay, thank you and sorry for going over time. Okay, so thanks for the of a talk, so I'm sorry. So we are aware that there were serious problems with uh, connection for certain of the uh, of the attendees. So we are sorry. We we will try to make make it better, but uh, unfortunately, it seems it's an internet problem. Uh, in any case, you'll get you'll have uh, the YouTube video if you want to, if you could not follow the talk. So now we have uh, questions. Uh, uh, so I saved a few questions, three questions, three questions actually to, to uh, for the end of the talk. The first one is uh, someone is asking uh, maybe if you, could you repeat what what uh, why TP is rela related to the motivic stuff here? Uh, you mean motivic stuff? You mean the commutative world? I imagine that's the question, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So so the the relation is as follows. Uh, yes, so the, the relation is as follows. So if you take the TP uh, zero or one uh, of your, so let me do like this. TP is, is too periodic and you take the TP of this DG category, you take your scheme and this one, it turns out that this uh, gives you on the positive part and the negative part, you'll get the, the sum of the even groups of the crystalline cohomology of your skin and on the on the negative part it gives you the sum of the odd cohomology groups on crystalline cohomology so this telling you that well this invariant of course in, after inverting p uh, uh, this tells you that well when you compute it on this uh, dg category you get the crystalline cohomology not individual pieces but up to parity and moreover now you also here, uh, so when you, you, you see that this TP comes equipped with the cyclotomic Frobenius, but this cyclotomic Frobenius, as I made this remark, is not Z2 graded, okay? It's not a Z2 graded thing. When you change to N to N minus two, there is a, a, a scalar that appears. So let me say that I'm with P0 and P1, zero and one. And now I have the, the cyclotomic Frobenius zero and one here, and they correspond to something here, and they here, they correspond to the sum of the even uh, cyclotomic Frobenius on X, but with a certain uh, multiply, a scalar multiplied by it, and here the sum of the cyclotomic Frobenius, but multiplied by P minus T minus one over two. So intuitively speaking, this is telling you that uh, you lose the weights when you pass from X 
to this category, you can recover everything up to weights. You lose the weights. But for the conjecture, that is enough. You don't lose anything in terms of the conjecture. Uh, so I, I want to testify here if the colors are completely unreadable. So don't use colors. Do you use colors? colors. Yeah. So maybe the, uh, maybe the uh, green. This is better. Slightly. Slightly. Okay. So okay. Okay. Just a remark. So there, there was an another question about the relation. So I just say it again about the relation between uh, the NC conjecture and the and the usual one. And so that's that's on the blackboard. They are equivalent. The smooth proper case. With, so, uh, which one? No, the, ah. the, the, the non-commutative and the usual yeah. one. So that's what you stated. And uh, also there's a, a question. So do any of these conjectures have a mixed characteristic analog or formulation? Uh, I don't know uh, what you want to be working over a DVR of, or something like that. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I haven't talked about that seriously, but I imagine that yeah, it's likely that you could expect something like that. Yes. Okay. So this is this is related, in fact. So there's another question about the relative versions of this conjecture. Is there are there relative versions of this conjecture? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, yes. I mean, in the classical world, yes. I think there are some some of them admit. Uh, Relative versions, yes. Uh, I haven't explored that. Yes, that's a good question. That's okay. good thing for the future, yes. So how, how do things work in families and things like that? Yeah. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not sure to understand the question correctly, but now, but I just read it. So what is A tensor M and, and does it agrees, agree with a perf X to the M in the geometric case? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, when you, you yeah, you, you, when you do this, uh, this it's, uh, it's this. I'm, uh, I'm, my schemes are nice enough for which this kind of phenomena holds, yes. So uh, in the, I imagine that this question is about the nil potent equivalence relation because on one side, it was on cycles on Xn on cycles on Xn and the other side was on the K0 of your A tensor M. And when A is of this form, perf of X, it's, yeah, there is this. Thanks, so that was, that was a question of uh, Remy van Dobben de Boom. There's also a question by Ola Sande. Is the nilpotent conjecture equivalent to the bellinson sule conjecture? And uh, Bellinson is only over a finite field. Bellinson Sule. Ah, Bellinson Sule. Maybe you can recall me what it is. It's I the know. vanishing of um, va vanishing of motivic homology in uh, in degrees in, in negative degree. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. I have to dig in. Uh, yeah, I think I remember that uh, there are close connections between the two. I don't know if it's exactly the same, but yeah. Yeah, I don't remember from the top of my head. So I think there's no direct relation. Okay, if you if you put all conjectures, oh, I think I think the the the, the Soule, uh, it's actually the strong is is actually the Tate conjecture, and then you mod out by the numerical equivalence. Bellinson Soule? Yeah, it's not. It, no, it's just vanishing of a motivic homology in in simplicial in negative simplicial degree, but. Okay, okay. okay, so I have to. Could you please state precisely how the Eladic Tate conjectures are formula formulated via TP? Uh, no, uh, via TP, I'm formulating the, 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 the TP version of this, right? Uh, so for this, I'm using the TP. It's actually, I'm using TP to formulate the P version of the Tate conjecture, right? And I formulated the, the L version of the Tate conjecture using uh, uh, K theory, in fact, right? And the question is if you can do that. Yes, uh, I mean, that can be done, uh, but it's using these results of Thomason that tells you that uh, 
I mean, the, the relation the relation is uh, is that you have a, a atia Earsbrook spectral sequence that goes from uh, Eladic uh, uh, cohomology to Etalke theory. So you have something like this. So rationally, so they prove that it degenerates. So you have something like the etal k theory of X um, when you complete at L and then you, you rationalize. That is in fact the, the sum of this uh, uh, Eladic uh, cohomology groups. And so here you already have a link between the etal cohomology with k theory, but it's an uh, etal k theory but then you have this uh, beautiful result of Thomason that tells you that you can write this algebraically because you have L, you have completed at L. Uh, it's in fact, you take the K theory of U and do localize with respect to the complex K theory. And then if you complete at L, actually you get the same spec. And now here you have K theory. So something that you can phrase for any digital theory, for any generality. And then, if, so you see that then the reformulation of the conjecture would be saying that if you go from the Sharn character from the K0 to here, it actually uh, lands precise on the things that are stable and the, the action of the absolute color rule. So that's one way to phrase it. It's so I think it was already, orig, already phrased like this in an old paper of uh, Friedlander. If I remember okay. correctly. So I have another question. So are there any uh, strictly non-commutative application of uh, the conjectures or, or any of the conjectures? Yes, I mean, uh, this is somehow motivation. Uh, usually, let's say that uh, what if we divide the world in two, uh, much more people would work on this side than on this side, I agree. And so people are motivated on trying to prove this. But on this side, these conjectures, as we'll see on Wednesday, for example, will allow us to have a, a conditional description of the category of non-commutative numerical motives, something a bit analog to what Milne has done, describe it in terms of uh, veil numbers up to a certain action of the absolute Calva group and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we will attack, for example, uh, this conjecture uh, next time on Wednesday, for example, we'll prove that all these conjectures uh, hold if you put here an algebra which is finite dimensional and of finite global dimension, not necessarily commutative. And all these non-commutative conjectures hold. So, uh, yeah. So we can, uh, that's uh, also, uh, there are two paths. So there's Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday, uh, we go in this non-commutative direction and Thursday on this commutative direction. And in both cases, we are going to explore the link between these two. Yeah. So there's another question about, uh, uh, so are there any new cases known uh, where the conjectures, the, the conjecture holds in the non-commutative setting? Uh, what it, what uh, happens on, on Thursday, what I will explain is a way to prove this conjecture in some new cases where you don't use geometry. What you do is you prove this conjecture use, using some non-commutative techniques. And as a consequence, you get this conjecture for axes which are, were known, not known previously. Um, if I if I understood correctly the question, is, is this more or less what he was asking? Yeah, if I can so. new cases, yes, on the very last talk, I will prove the classical conjectures in new cases. And the way to prove it is not using geometry, but using this viewpoint, this non-commutative viewpoint. Uh, last question, is there a paper <laughs> attached to this mini course where we can read more details? Yes, absolutely. In fact, there is a survey on archive whose title is equal to the title of this course. So I think, uh, which is called uh, non-commutative counterparts of celebrated conjectures, if I remember. Okay, so there's no more question in, in the chat.
it seems are there questions in the in the room no 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 okay uh, so good thing <laughs> thanks again gonzalo so, so we sorry for going over time i got a bit confused with the times so. yeah yeah okay and sorry for the, the those who had problems with the connection okay so we meet again in at uh, six